All right, hello everyone and welcome to this month's capacity building webinar series uh, on the Dodd-Frank Act and how to comply with new standards. Uh, the voice you're hearing right now is April Reardon. I am the capacity building director here at Habitat for Humanity of Minnesota. Uh, we host a monthly web conference like this with varying topics. Uh, every month, the last Wednesday of each month from 11 a.m. until 12.15, I know we're joined by um, lots of folks from affiliates in surrounding states today. So we've got a pretty big turnout to hear about this important topic. But just um, so you know, we happen to schedule it during a time when we normally have a web conference for our affiliates as well. Um, so for those of you in Minnesota, our next topic in January will focus on our VISTA program and to really highlight some of the benefits of hosting a VISTA and tips for a successful placement as we get ready to apply for a new round of VISTAs. Uh, and just to note that all attendees, if you're logged in here today, you will receive slides and other resources via email after the web conference. So we can send you everything that you look at or if resources get mentioned, I'll be jotting those down and I can send you a follow up email with some of that information. Let's see. Uh, and so for those of you who haven't used, perhaps haven't used GoToWebinar before, there's different ways to participate. Because we have such a big group today, everyone right now is muted. So you can't, we can't hear any of our attendees. It's just myself and our panelists that, that you'll be able to hear right off the bat. But this is definitely an interactive session and we want to hear your questions. So there's a couple different ways that you can share those questions. Some of those were shared in advance and that'll, that will help us um, get started with the conversation. You can also, if you are connected to a microphone or if you're on the phone or if your computer has a built-in microphone, you can raise your hand. There's a little hand on your control panel that you can raise and then I'll be looking for that and I can unmute you so you can talk with us. Um, you also have this little box on your control panel called questions. Um, it's questions, comments, that's kind of your chat box. And so you can type a question in there. Um, only myself and our panelists will see that right off the bat. Um, if it's a comment for the whole, um, for all of our attendees, then I can share that with everybody. Um, but it's also, I might just jump in and I can ask those questions on your behalf if you don't have audio and, or just don't want to talk live on the session. That's another way to get your questions in. And let's see, without further ado, I'm going to switch over to some slides uh, that we have received from HFHI. Um, but I do have a couple of polls just to find out a little bit more about who is with us <clears throat> today. I can get this window open. Well, let me start with the poll. Um, so we know that some of you might have more than one person sitting at a computer participating with you today. And so if you could let us know how many attendees, including yourself, so the total number of people are participating with you today. This is helpful for us and helpful for HFHI to know and for all the other SSOs who sent people, <coughs> excuse me, to know how many people are with us today. All right, just about everybody has voted now. All right, so that's good to know. We do have about um, almost 20% of you have more than one person with you, but lots of you are participating alone. Um, I also, we wanted to see how many of you were able to listen to the recorded webinar before today's session. I know there were some delays in getting that out to you, which I'm sure Sonia and will speak to, um, and some had a little bit of technical difficulty with the recorded webinar. So just let us know how many we're able to listen to that ahead of time. <coughs> All right. It looks pretty good. Here we go. So 64% were able to listen to it, but there is a good chunk of you who were not able to listen to that yet. And so, um, you know, we'll try to get you caught up or you can listen to some of the questions, but it might be good to go back and try to do that later. And um, our folks from HFHI, I'm sure, can help um, anybody who had some te technical difficulties in accessing that, that webinar. 
Uh, and finally, we're going to do a little pre and post test just about how you're feeling about uh, this new legislation and your ability to comply with the new standards. So I'll give you a moment to read through those options. But, um, you know, are you feeling pretty good about it? Like, I understand the standards. I'm confident that we can do this. Um, are you I kind of get it? And I'm pretty confident. Um, feeling pretty unsure and don't know, or are you totally confused and not at all confident <laughs> that you know what to do? Um, you can also, if none of those really fit your scenario, you can choose other as well. But then maybe at the and then I'm hoping that at the end of the um, conference, web conference today, we can ask that question again and see if people are feeling a little bit better. All right, I've got about 85% of us voted. That's about as high as we've gotten on all of these. So all right we have some work to do to get move this green group maybe into that pink section and and try to get the purple group up there and hopefully your three percent who are totally confused we can really move that needle for you by offering this session so thank you okay i am trying to get my uh slides here to open um sonia do you want to um say anything here while I'm trying to get that um, PDF from you to, to open up here? Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, here at HFHI, I've got myself, Sonia Lee, and also Sabrina Fitz, who is a staff attorney here at HFHI. Uh, and we are really excited to, we're really excited to um, do this Q&A with you. And thank you for the folks who've had an opportunity to look at the presentation um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer all your questions. If we're not able to answer your questions, we will certainly um, take your questions down and um, get answers from the expert. Uh, Sabrina and I just left our, our community meeting and it was um, a very empowering meeting and I just want to say thank you um, for all you do in the communities that you serve, for the families that you support and help to, um, to with their home ownership dreams. It was we just watched a very powerful video, and um, it was it was really. If we ever lose sight of what we do, that video that we saw certainly brings it home, and we know why we're here. And HFHI, a lot of times because we're in the office doing the sundry stuff, all the background stuff, we don't really see the impact of the work that we do, especially the work that you all do as affiliates. Um, so I just want to say thank you on behalf of um, HFHI for all you do in your community. Um, and Sonia, if I'm not sure if you're moving around or, but the audio kind of cuts out a little bit. If you can try to stay close to your microphone, that would be great. Okay. Thanks. We'll try. Thanks. <laughs> all right. And. Did you want to start with a little bit of the basics or help people out, or do you want to jump into questions? We had several questions that were submitted in advance that I did send your way, but I also have those in front of me, or we can invite people to start submitting their questions. I know that um, there was one person who had asked the question, what do I need to know <laughs> regarding this well, upcoming legislation? <laughs> she acknowledged right. it was a very general question, but I think she might be speaking for many people about what do I need to know. All right. Well, I'll start off and just give a little bit on the MPAR um, initiative here at HFHI, and then I can go into answering questions. Hang on one second. Are you logged in on two separate spots? Yes. Because <laughs> it's we're hearing both. Are you here? We couldn't hear. I thought. Yeah, I thought you couldn't hear me from my okay, laptop. Okay. All right. So. You sound good right now. That sounds good right now. Okay. Okay. So I, I shouldn't move from here. Okay. Yeah, that right. sounds good. <laughs> all right. So we'll start off and give you a little history on the Empire Initiative. And then um, I can start answering the questions that were sent in earlier. Is that okay? Great. Awesome. All right. So for those of you um, that may not be aware, the Empire Initiative is something that um, was starting. It started in 2010 when the whole Safe Act came about. Uh, HFHI realized that there was definitely a need, not just for advocacy, but also for us to definitely get 
in front of the regulations and understand what the impact um, was going to be for affiliates. Um, so the exemption, the, the state the state act exemption came and went. There were a lot of states that got state exemptions from it, which was really good. But that really propelled us into everything else that the Dodd Frank Act was bringing to the table for the mortgage industry. Um, we continued. Uh, we built a team uh, that consists of our government relations group in Washington D.C., the legal team, my team, which is the affiliate uh, financial services team and a great number of other field staff, we come together and we understand, first of all, GRA and legal looks at the, the laws that are coming in and uh, determine what the effects are going to be for the affiliates. Is it going to be a major change? Is this just business as usual? What do we need to do? And then the working group, we decide um, how we're going to train staff as well as what type of resources do we need to put out on my habitat and then get the ball rolling. Uh, we've done some, um, some very good things over the last little while. We have updated what used to be called MPAR, the MPAR homepage. It's now MPAR University. And Sabrina, who is with me, she uh, was a major player with getting that done. We've organized it in such a fashion that it's easy for an affiliate. If you are in the origination process of your loan, you can pop into the origination house, if you will, on that uh, on uh, MPAR University and it'll give you um, different templates and resources that will help you through that process. Um, for servicing there is also a house which is uh, MPAR 201. We also have one for other laws and one for leveraging as well. So we've kind of broken it down um, in an easy way for affiliates to to find resources that need, they need for different phases of the lending of their lending. Uh, we have also engaged an outside counsel from Washington, D.C. to assist us with really navigating through all the laws and um, just ensuring that we have a good understanding of the impact uh, of these laws with our affiliates. And also, um, our government relations team, who has been working tirelessly throughout this whole thing from the States back to right now to really get our mission in front of the, of the government to let them understand that these laws really have an impact and a negative impact on habitat. And if we were to uh, follow all the laws to the letter, then we wouldn't be able to really exist as we do today. So the GRA team has been very successful in getting some exemptions from us, and we'll talk about them a little bit later, uh, as well as they have just um, introduced a bill working with some rep uh, representatives um, they've just introduced a new bill into the House, uh, which is basically to protect uh, Habitat Home Homeowner Act. I think that's what it's called, or something like that. But the bill has gone through. There's a lot of um, positive. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, positive um, reaction to it. It's been well received. And we've asked, a lot of you should have received an email blitz from the GRA office um, asking for folks to sign on to the letter which was going to accompany the bill in support of the bill. So if you have already done that, thank you very much. Um, the bill simply is to provide a carve out of three particular things in the new laws. Uh, one is actually an older law, but one is the ability to repay which is a, it's a, it's a really tricky rule for Habitat affiliates. Um, the majority of the affiliates do fall under uh, an exemption. And that, for that exemption, you have to extend uh, credit less than 200 times a year. And for us, in a lot of affiliates, it can add up pretty quickly because an extension of credit under this law is your first lien and any subordinate liens, they're all counted individually. And it also includes any repair loans that are secured by the dwelling, that's also considered a credit extension. So since that's going to become a moving target, that 200 number is going to become a moving target for a lot of the affiliates, we felt the need that we should try our best to really um, be completely exempt from that part of the regulation. We're also, the bill also includes um, a carve out for folks that service in-house, more specifically any of the affiliates that service in-house that may be 
um, servicing for other affiliates. Uh, the way the, the law is written right now, there is a small servicer exemption which most of the affiliates that service in-house do fall under. But if you service for another affiliate, then you fall outside of that exemption and you have to uh, set up your shop. You have to have full infrastructure like any other uh, regular servicer. And the third item that's in that bill, um, it really has to do with a law that it's been out for some time now, and it has to do with donated appraisals. Habitat uh, International did get verbal approval from HUD some years ago, well, two years ago, that we could accept donated appraisals because we know that a lot of our appraisals that we get are donated. Um, so we have gotten approval that we could use it, but we've never had it in writing. So we're looking for that in writing. So those are the three things that are in the bill that was just introduced in November in the House. Um, there is going to be a companion bill that's going to be going through the Senate. Our GRA team is currently um, working on crafting that bill right now, and it should be introduced sometime in the new year. Are there any questions so far? About the bill or right. about, okay, about the bill or? So I will, about the bill, anything that I've just said. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I had some people who were, I didn't have any slides or images to go along with that. So there were some no, people who no, were confused. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, okay. All right. So just um, to continue, there are, there are, Four, there are many, many rules, mortgage rules that are coming out, but the four that have the biggest impact on Habitat are um, there is a piece, a new thing that's added to the SAFE Act, Safe Act, which is under the Truth in Lending, and it has to do with um, validating or ensuring that anybody that's identified as a loan originator, sorry. Anyone that's identified as a loan originator, you have to complete a background check, a criminal check, and also have to identify through that person um, whether they have been convicted or has pled guilty to any type of um, offenses. Now, um, the law is what they identify as a loan originator is someone that will take a loan application, will negotiate loans. And when we say take loan application, not someone that will just take it from someone delivering it, but someone that is actually going to be working with um, the family, um, taking it, looking at it, going through the application with the potential homeowner, as well as um, negotiate, negotiating terms or discussing those things um, with the with the potential uh, family. Um, so you have to have effective on January 18th, you must ensure that you pull a criminal background check and a credit report as well as get information from the incumbent of any, um, any convictions. The law also goes on to say if there's someone that is in that position today that um, you, ha you are aware that they may have been convicted of a crime within the last seven years, that you have to complete the background check, but the credit report and so on, uh, and validate it. And if it is, to, if it is determined to be true, then um, they cannot hold the role of a loan originator. Uh, there are certain convictions that um, if someone has been convicted or pled guilty to fraud or money laundering, they cannot ever hold the role of a loan the role of a loan originator. Okay. Uh, another one of the um, the rules that uh, is going to affect Habitat it, it's under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and it um, has to do with appraisals. Currently, we should be providing a notice or a disclosure to our borrowers that they are entitled to receive a copy of the credit, uh, sorry, not the credit, the appraisal or whatever your valuation tool is. And if they want to receive a copy of it, then what they would do is um, send it in writing that they requested in writing that they would like a copy of it. Starting in January, what your notice is going to say is to the borrower is that you are entitled to or you will receive a copy of your appraisal or valuation tool. And you have until three days, um, you 
once the evaluation tool or the appraisal um, is done on the house, and that's whatever you use to determine the price of the house, it, um, you have to promptly deliver it to your borrower. Um, the borrower can say they don't want it, but you are obligated to, to provide it to them at least at minimum three days before the house closes. There is also uh, the ability to repay rules, which we talked about. Uh, um, Sonia, can we go back? They have a question about background checks. Yep, certainly. So there's a question from Eric that says background checks on applicants or originator. Is there Are there more details on this somewhere? Okay. Uh, the CFPB website has a lot of information, and I do uh, recommend that you make it your favorite. Uh, we and also on MPAR University, we also have a lot of resources. Some will take you to the CFPB site, but we do have a lot of resources. There's a great uh, frequently asked question document that uh, we just updated and uh, posted on my habitat under MPARU. So please take advantage of that. So in terms of background checks and originate background checks. There are two different kinds of background checks that we're speaking of. We do, HFHI strongly recommends that you um, do a background check for your homeowner, your borrower, or applicants. Um, it is a strong, it's a recommendation. It is not something that you have to do at this time. The only thing that has to be done on your applicant is the sex offender check. Uh, for loan originators, this is now the law that they have, they actually have to um, if they're taking on that role as a loan, originer, a loan originator effective January 18th, you have to do these background checks on them. So pull a credit report, pull a background check, um, and also get other information from the applicant, from the, um, the incumbent, the loan originator themselves. And the other thing that's important to note is the person cannot act in the role of a loan originator until all these checks have been done and you've determined that they are um, clear. Does that answer your question? We'll see if he... <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right, so, um, so there's a follow-up question to that. So Dana asks, so in small affiliates, the loan originator is the executive director? Oh, it could be, and um, if they're considered a loan originator, then um, if there's a new one that's being hired after January 18th, then yes, you will have to complete all the checks, the criminal background check, the credit report, and also uh, have a discussion with them in terms of any administrative, civil, or criminal determinations that, uh, that they've had. All right, and then there's a couple more comments there. So if we use a lawyer, are they the originator or staff? And then another comment was, so would that be all the folks on the selection committee or just the chair or director? It seems kind of similar. So I don't know if you can address that. It depends that. on how you structured. CFPB has a, um, has defined a loan originator and it is pretty broad and it's actually broader than how the SAFE Act um, determines a loan originator. So I would recommend that you look on the CFPB website and you'll get the information, but it is, it's, a, it's a long list and it could be all of your committee. Um, if you, one person is only doing a visit, that may not be considered a loan origination, but if they're doing, each of them are doing all the components, then they could all be considered loan originators. Okay, we have somebody with their hand up. Natasha, I'm going to unmute you so you could ask your question, and then we do have a couple more after that as well, okay? Here we go. Natasha, I'm unmuting you so you can ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? We sure can. Yes. Yep, you sound oh, great. My question is, if, if you have a third-party um, servicer, do you, what, is your, what is our responsibility if we do have a third-party servicer in terms of um, I guess not in terms of qualifying people but for servicing like are there certain things that we should questions we should be asking or procedures we should request for them to ensure they're in compliance all of the above <laughs> the 
servicers are required to follow the law. They are also um, they also become a regulated um, entity. So one of the things that I would do if your servicing contract um, ha exists before next January, I would go through and look at the contract and um, have a conversation with your servicer because there, there are things that are going to be different in the new year for servicers and they also have to comply. Uh, for some affiliates, they do split the, the servicing process where their service just does a payment processing and then settles with the affiliate and the affiliate does the loss mitigation piece. So if, you're, if you've got a family that's past due, the affiliate's the one that's sending out the notices, following up with phone calls and so on. The new law makes that situation really, really tricky. If you have that situation, you really need to have a conversation with your servicer and really define where, where, where their work stops and where your, yours begins and make sure that you have policies in place and procedures in place because you can fall out of compliance really easy with a split process like that. Um, there are okay. a lot of servicers that have sent out messages to their um, to their clients to let them know that effective January they'll be doing everything instead of splitting off the process. So you need to look at your contract, see what and ensure that and have a conversation with your your servicer and ask them what's changed for them in the new year and um, you know so you can see the impact. You may have to let your your families know that there's going to be some change depending on what's happening with your servicer but just be guided by your contract and have a conversation with your your servicer okay so i have a lot of what if okay. questions here too thank you natasha thanks okay so um so do existing eds have to go through the background process or just new ones so i think that's kind of a clarifying question but so right. do we, go ahead. The only time someone that is in a loan originator, existing in a loan originator role has to go through the background checks is uh, if the board possibly or someone in the affiliate has knowledge that they may have been convicted or pled guilty to a crime. Okay. And then, then they have to do it. Okay. We, and we do also recommend, um, we, HFHI does recommend that there's an annual check done on loan originators and for the, the purpose that something can happen throughout the year um, or you know something may come up after because we want to make sure that we are seen as responsible lenders in the industry so we have to make sure that we are doing taking all the necessary steps to ensure that we comply. Yeah. Um, okay so a couple more. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is it sufficient to just have the executive director as the loan originator? Um, that's really up to the affiliate. Uh, it depends on how they're structured, it depends on how many people, and, you know, staff and volunteers there are. It really depends on the affiliate. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. Okay, and so a couple comments that I'll condense here. So somebody was just clarifying. So annual credit checks and background checks on volunteers and the executive director? Uh, if they're acting in a loan originator role specifically, yes. Then the recommendation is annual check, right? Okay. Not required, but that's the recommendation, right? And then um, if a back, so this, I think we've answered this question then too. I just want to make sure, Julie, that you know that your question was answered. So then if a background check was completed at the time of hire four years ago, does another one need to be conducted? And so the recommendation there seems like that that would be the responsible thing to do or is that required? Yes, it, it is the it is the responsible thing to do. Okay. Um, and then a couple more. So what if an affiliate has a local financial institution servicing their loans but have no servicing contract? But I missed the last part. Okay. Sorry, what, it, what if an affiliate has a local financial institution servicing their loans, but they don't have a servicing contract? I would suggest you get one. 
Okay. And then uh, that's a short answer. <laughs> There's somebody who's asking, just can you define the loan originator role for us a little bit? Maybe that would help. So another the, question. Uh, about I don't have the list. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I can bring I it up. I do have it written down. In some other notes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So defined by CFPB, a loan originator takes an application, arranges a credit transaction, assists a consumer in applying for credit, uh, they offer or negotiate terms, they make um, an extension of credit, they refer a consumer to a loan originator or a creditor, um, they advertise to the public that they perform loan origination services. Those are the um, definition by CFPB. Okay. Uh, great. I was looking to see if maybe there was something on these slides that we could show everybody. There's also a question about just, do you have examples of service or contracts then? Are servicing contracts that folks can use? Is that something that might be a, on my habitat or in the Empire University area of examples? No, of we don't have any servicing contracts. That's usually between the servicer and the client and the servicer usually draws it up. So any that we have are confidential and we it's not something that we post. Okay. But if, if for someone that has specific questions on servicing, um, if you could just give them my contact information, mm -hmm. April, and then um, either either myself or Joe Honeycutt, we can walk them through uh, the process and the things that they need to look for in their contract. And I can say, I know Joe is coming to our conference in March. And um, yes, he is. Yeah. So. I mean, but not that anybody wants to wait till March to get their questions answered. So I'll post your, um, con both of your contact information in the follow-up email as well. But okay. Um, I don't know if you want to just keep going or yeah. wait for more questions. So we still have some of the questions that were submitted in advance as well. Okay. I do. I do. I just wanted to go over the, um, great. The, the rules that are going to affect us. So okay. the ability to repay rule is another of the four rules um, that affect us. And as I said earlier, the ability to repay rule is essentially that the the lender affiliate has determined in good faith that the borrower or the partner, potential partner family has the ability to repay the loan. Uh, they need to have written policy of their written underwriting policies. So we need to ensure, uh, we go about our daily work, we do a great job of it, but a lot of these things we need to ensure that we have a policy for and we need to have um, procedures to execute that policy. And we have to follow them consistently because there are, you know, our fair lending laws and our equal credit opportunity laws, they can kick in if we're treating um, applicants differently. So the ability to repay rule, we do have an exemption because we are a nonprofit that serve low to moderate income families and we the majority of the affiliates do extend less than 200 credit a year so and I'm sure most of you would fall in that category so just ensure that you do have a good policy for underwriting as well as uh, companion uh, procedures to go with them and the final rule is the mortgage servicing rules they're gonna the changes are pretty big um, the majority of affiliates do fall under the small service or exemption because you own or originated um, the loans that you service and you service less than 5,000 loans. Uh, some of the changes include uh, there must be a policy and procedures in place. There's some um, discussion on or some, some new changes to foreclosures. There are specific things in terms of loss mitigation and also response to questions and um, an error resolution. Now for affiliates specifically, um, we're exempt from a lot of those things, but some of the things that we're not exempt from under the small servicer exemption is the error resolution and information request. So we need to make sure that um, we acknowledge receipt of any um, information request or error re um, resolution request within five days. 
we have to correct it and provide written notification to the um, to the borrower and um, we have to provide them with information if we're not if we're unable to provide a resolution or find a resolution or the information we have to provide it written um, information to them what we've done and um, why it's not available one of the other things under the servicing rule that we have um, part of the exemption does not apply to us but one of the part one part under forced placed insurance is that as a small servicer if your homeowner's insurance or hazard insurance gets cancelled for whatever reason uh, if the affiliate is able to procure insurance at or below the cost that your homeowner was paying then you have to force place the insurance if you can only get insurance prices that are higher than um, than what your homeowner was getting then you're not obligated as a small servicer to force place that insurance one thing I do always say is I caution you because that asset is yours it's the affiliates until that mortgage is paid so it is in your best interest to ensure that there is a hazard insurance on that house another rule is under the loss mitigation and we have uh, we're exempt from a good part of that rule but a couple things that um, we still have to comply with we cannot uh, make the first notice or filing required to foreclose unless a consumer's mortgage loan is more than 120 days delinquent also we cannot move for foreclosure judgment if the homeowner is uh, performing uh, to the terms of a loss mitigation agreement okay. another thing that we have to comply with is prompt crediting of payments and response to uh, credit payoffs we have a question um, uh -huh. if the affiliate is exempt from ability to repay, et cetera. Does that exemption pass on to the financial institution that we would be selling our mortgage to? Or yes, do we, it does. Okay, or do yes, we need to meet the standard of the financial institution? Okay. No, um, the, the ability to repay exemption just, it stays with the loan, even if you're selling it to um, an institution that is not under the exemption. So it does stay with the loan. Okay, and then another question also from Christy. Um, in terms of delinquency, what is considered a modification? Is a payment plan a modification? A modification happens when you actually change the terms or revise the terms of the loan agreement. So it may not, you can do, like if you do a forbearance, um, the forbearance agreement is not the modification, but if you do the forbearance works and you then modify to add on the delinquency to the end of the loan, that piece of it would be a modification. Okay. Okay. All right. Keep All right, coming, uh, everybody. <laughs> a reminder, you can, just a reminder to everybody, you can raise your hand as well if you want to just ask your question and talk a little bit. That's okay. All right. Um, so prompt crediting of payments in response to a request for payoff is another rule that um, even under the small service or exemption, uh, we still have to comply with. So essentially, we have to promptly credit uh, the day of receipt. So I know some of the smaller affiliates, maybe you're not in the office every day, but if you, if the, you receive the check in the office on Monday, or it could be Tuesday and you're in the office on Wednesday, you need to ensure that you're putting the correct date against uh, the payment for their principal and not the date that you actually log it because that was the day in your office. Um, there's also a, um, one of the things they talk about with prompt crediting, there is also a partial payment uh, piece to that. They, the law does allow you to accept partial payments, but one of the strong recommendations is when you receive a partial payment is to hold it in a suspense account or an unapplied account, whatever you want to call it, until the full contractual amount of that payment is received. Once it's received, then you would disperse it based on how your, your mortgage agreement is, is written. 
Um, there are a lot of affiliates that uh, once they receive a partial payment because they're happy to get payment, they will apply it to escrow and, and so on. And then what tends to happen and what we've witnessed many times and ends up putting a lot of um, affiliates into financial trouble is that the, the uh, principal balance oftentimes when uh, partial payments are accepted are inaccurate. Not to mention the escrow piece is also out of whack. And in terms of escrow, just a little sidebar conversation, please ensure that you have a separate account for your escrow um, monies. Escrow money should not be commingled with the affiliate's money because it is the homeowner's money. It is not the affiliate's money. You're just holding it in trust, just in a, like an attorney holds, um, like your down payment or so on in trust. And that's the way it has to be treated. That's not an HFHI directive. It's actually the law. So please ensure that your um, escrow monies is in a federally insured institution um, and it's separate than any of the affiliates money. Uh, we have a question here. Um, it says, so for Marie, we send a notice of intent to foreclose. Uh, we call this a pre foreclosure letter. Our legal advisors send a notice of mortgage foreclosure sale. Which of these is the first notice that we can't send until 120 days. Yeah, and I did I share that too, so you could read it. <laughs> this is Sabrina. I think the answer to your question is the second one you couldn't send without 120 days. And that is you can send letters that say, if you don't catch up on your payments, then we will initiate foreclosure. Mm -hmm. But what you can't do until 120 days has run is, um, if it's a non-judicial state, advertise in the in the newspaper that you have to advertise it in and send notice of that advertisement. Or if it's a judicial state, um, file your first pleading for the foreclosure. So we would have to maybe see what these letters say, but so long as that first one is just notice of intent to foreclose, eventually if the borrower doesn't catch up, then that's okay. Whereas the second one, my guess is that attaches the foreclosure advertisement and that's not okay until 120 days has run. Okay, got a number of other questions here. Um, when you say a suspense account, does it have to be a separate bank account or can it just be a bookkeeping entry? Uh, honestly, I think that's going to have to be up to the affiliate. If you've got good bookkeeping or accounting management, then it might be just um, a bookkeeping notation, but still going into probably the escrow account or a, it may have to be a separate account. I think it does have to be a separate yeah. account. Yes. I think it does. Just talking through it, I believe it should. Yeah. It does have to be a separate account. Okay. Uh, so here's another question. So if we are in a payment plan with a homeowner, say to clear the delinquency within three to four months and do not enter into a formal modification, can we still accept partial payments and be in compliance? Sorry, Sorry, repeat that again. I'm, so I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share this one then too, and I'll just say thanks. But um, uh, so okay. So it's if we're in a payment plan with a homeowner, and you know her example is like say to clear the delinquency within three to four months, and do not enter into a formal modification. You know, is it okay to keep accepting partial payments, and will they still be in compliance if they do that? Okay, if I if I understand the question, um, yeah, so and, I, you, and I shared it, so hopefully a, you can see it. Yeah, okay. If you if you've set up a payment plan with the family, the whole point is that they're supposed to stick to that payment payment plan and not give partial payments. If they're giving partial payments, then they're not holding their end of the agreement. Okay. Okay. And finally, so far, our old mortgages have a, I think this is maintenance account that we include in the escrow. Is that still allowed? Um, it it is something still allowed. I, 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 okay, yeah. 
It is still allowed. We just we caution affiliates on the use of that money because again that escrow account belongs to the homeowners. So if we, you know, does it? Are we using it for? Is there a specific reason for this maintenance? Is this something that the affiliate or, or the homeowner can draw from at any time? Like, how is it being used? You need to ensure that you're not really trying to manage your homeowner's money. Okay. okay. Um, and we have a hand raised. So I'm going to call on Parker can, for that. We go to the oh, hand, sure. sure. We, can we just um, let's tackle some of the questions that were that were sent in early? Oh, okay. Hang on, Parker. We'll get to you in just a second. Okay. Oh, and Eric's got his hand up too. We've got a couple hands raised. And then um, there's one person who has a question just to clarify on something we just talked about. So if I can throw that one in here. Um, okay. So she says, to clarify, in current agreements, sometimes the family will break their payments into two to three partial payments per month to catch up instead of paying one full payment. Is that okay? If that is the agreement that was made with the homeowner and the affiliate, then that's fine. But if your agreement is that we're going to get a monthly payment on this date every month and they give you partial payments and they're not um, abiding by the agreement. Okay. So, I mean, you're, the affiliate is perfectly within their right to work with a family and accept three payments in the month to make that monthly payment. But that's how the agreement needs to be set out. All right, so now we're, we're going to do some of the questions that were submitted beforehand and then we'll get to our, our hands raised and any other questions that come in as after that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we have is, in terms of a qualified mortgage, what is the correct way to count student loan debt in the, um, in the, if, in the debt to income ratio when an applicant has a student loan and deferment and has not worked out a monthly payment as yet. Um, qualified mortgage, <clears throat> because we are under the ability to repay uh, exemption, we don't have to worry about a, um, doing a qualified mortgage. So that just right off the bat. But in terms of student loan debt, one of the things that we need to consider, some creditors do look at deferment and take it into consideration and some creditors don't. You're going to have to make a decision and put it in your policy. One of the things that I would suggest to you is that you are, you have that conversation, you have evidence of the deferment and as well as how long that deferment is for. So if in six months the deferment is going to end, you want to make sure that you at least have an idea um, because that payment is going to come up pretty soon. So if you've done your, your DTI calculations and your person is sitting at 43 or above or, you know, thereabouts, you may want to do some additional coaching or wait some more, have them get um, lower some other debt because you know in six months or maybe even less that that student loan is going to kick in and certainly take them over that DTI, your, 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 your DTI, whatever you've set it at. So that there's no right or wrong. You just have to make sure that you have a policy that you're following that policy consistently with everyone. But I do recommend that you get a, a, you know, some information from your homeowner, your applicant on their deferment and when does the deferment end so that you can have a, um, uh, make a knowledgeable decision based on their DTI. All right. All right. Another question that came in: Does uh, does the wording of the 45-day late payment notice letter need to differ from the wording of the 60-day letter? Uh, when should we start sending out the letters uh, through certified mail? Please discuss using Keystone on uh, Keystone to track mortgages or for credit reporting. So I'll start off with um, Keystone. Keystone has an add-on software and it's no charge to affiliates that have an active Keystone license. It's called Key Credit. So if you have Key Credit, what you would do is to um, put your file through Key Credit and it puts it into the format that is needed to submit to the credit reporting agencies. 
you submit that through a, a secure web link or a secure website to More Than Data, which they own Keystone. Um, when More Than Data or your transmission, they will do a data in integrity check. If there are any issues, they'll contact the affiliate. If there are no issues, then they'll pass it on. Now, Keystone only reports to two credit bureaus, which is Equifax and TransUnion. Um, there's a $2 per mortgage per year charge for the service. Um, more than data also, they monitor any Equifax electronic disputes, but um, disputes that come from TransUnion are usually done in paper and be sent directly to the um, affiliate. Now, as for what needs to be in those notices, your 30, your 45-day notice and your 60-day notice. Um, the 45-day notice, you need to let them know what their options are. You also need to ensure that you've got the HUD 1-800 um, number for the counseling. And if you have a, um, a service member that's your homeowner, you need to also provide them with the service member um, delinquency notice, which it essentially, and you can find that on HUD, it, um, because their avenue to go to is uh, a little bit different. They go through their, their corporal channels, so you will just um, provide them with that notice. The 60-day notice, also you provide them with that, but I believe the new rules don't require you to send more than one notice. So one notice at 45 days, I think that's sufficient, correct? I think. Yeah, and I don't have it in front of me, but we have um, a template delinquency policy and template default letters that we recommend you sending with the contents. Can you send those to me so I can just send them out with the um, follow-up email? Or direct sure, or to me to where to find them? The link. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That way people don't, have, and then we save them the trouble of having to go find them. That's good. Um, can I just mention, at least for our Minnesota folks and any of the surrounding states who are thinking about coming to our conference, we did, I just heard this morning, though, from Larry, we had had some requests to have um, some Keystone workshops at our conference, but Larry let me know this morning that he, we've been working on it, and he will not be able to come to our conference, but has offered to do um, some webinars and training on Keystone. So I can certainly ask him about showing off a little bit of the key credit along with that. So we will be getting that to you, not at the conference, but in a different way. So, Right. Now, one of the things that HFHI strongly recommends is reporting to credit. And, and the cost, if you've got Keystone, the cost of $2 per month per um, or per mortgage per year is really inexpensive. Um, we find that delinquencies um, go down once you start reporting to the credit bureaus or the credit reporting agencies because you're essentially uh, rewarding folks that are, are holding up their end of the contract and then for the folks that are not, they're showing, they're seeing that there is an impact, that there is some consequences to them not paying on time. So we do strongly recommend that all affiliates make use of reporting to the credit agencies. Now, there was a question that uh, we received, but I I'm not sure, I wasn't completely sure of the question. Um, and I had reached out to, to the person that sent it in, and the concern is that um, their mortgages are managed by a bank. So they don't have, um, and I'm not sure what they mean by managed by a bank, uh, but they don't have the means to provide annual or regular disclosures. So what's the alternative? Um, on, on the MPARU, we've got a lot of disclosures that are there, the RESPA disclosures, the Truth and Lending disclosure um, that we've put out there for you, and the Equal Credit Opportunity, which is actually the appraisal disclosures. Those are out there. The, the, other, um, the other disclosures that are required, we are currently working to get them out there for you. So we should have templates for all of the disclosures 
out there probably by mid-January. By the time the rules click kick in, we should have all of the required disclosures out on my habitat under MPARU. Yeah, and I think that question was kind of, we don't, they were like, we don't officially, that they manage, I wonder if they meant that their mortgages are managed on spreadsheets, but are not, because they said that they're not officially on the books, which is probably a signal of some, maybe some other issues, but. Um, or I don't know if they're actually, maybe the bank is doing the origination. Yeah, form. yeah. So if the bank is doing an, if the bank is truly doing the origination for you, they are required to provide all the disclosures within the required time frames to the borrower. Okay. All right. So we do okay. have a we have a, a question, but then I'm I'm going to see if Parker's okay. ready to ask his question. I'm going to unmute you, Parker. Here we go. Can you hear me? We sure can. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Yes. Yep. My headset is working. Uh, this is a question based on the preliminary uh, uh, slideshow that um, we were provided. And this is under a section that I have listed here as CFPB. And there was a, something about free copies of appraisals, no, di no discrimination in lending practices. And then uh, t t the third and fourth points, I had a question out. Must send, uh, send an adverse action notice in 30 days. Is an adverse action notice a denial of an application? Yes, that is the the the, the industry name is a um, sorry is a, hang on a second the industry name is an adverse action notice. So if you even in the pre pre application phase, so when you're determining if a uh, applicant will come into the habitat program, if for whatever reason you are declining them, maybe their income is too high um, at the time, or you've determined that they're, they don't have the ability to repay, or they don't meet the need category, we are recommending that you do provide an adverse action notice. And what if they pass the, the initial screen and they go and the application goes to the Family Selection Committee, then there's is there any time limit? 30 uh, days. Oh, it's still 30 days. So basically, the, the Family Selection Committee has to um, complete their work within 30 days of receipt of the application. No, uh, yes and no. Let me just clarify in terms of an application, because that, that throws a lot of us off. When we, um, there's applications are defined in different regulations differently. But for the purpose of uh, TILA and RESPA, so, so the slide that just went up, there is a definition under uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, there's a definition under Equal Credit Opportunity, which is usually the guidance for the pre-application piece. And I say usually, but that's the best guide for it. For when we get down, so someone's been accepted into the program now and we're working with them, they're doing their sweat equity and the whole nine yards, this is truly t till and RESPA. Um, you have to have the six components and actually for Habitat it's seven components. So you have to have the borrower's name, their income, their social insurance, their social security number, sorry I'm Canadian. <laughs> uh, you've got to have the property address, so um, usually we don't have that early. We, then we have to have a value of the property and the loan amount and what the seventh item for Habitat is any other information that the affiliate needs to deter to call it an application. So for this piece of it, we may not we're not going to have that until we're probably maybe three or two months close to closing that loan. So at that point when you have all the seven items, you start your 30 days counting at that point. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, All right. Parker. And, we, I, and I, we, do, we do know that this process could take 6, 8, 10, 18 months at times, depending on um, how you're building and so on. So just it, an application is not just the paper with the words filled in. It's all of these things that you need to define an application. And please ensure, if there's one thing that you all can take away today, ensure that you have policies and companion procedures to go with them. 
Okay, you have to define your application because that number seven, um, the seventh item, if you will, is whatever else an, app, uh, an affiliate needs. Um, so you guys make sure that you define that, okay? Okay, and we have um, a couple, kind of a two-parter here, but it's a follow-up to the current question, and I just posted it too because it's kind of long so you could see it, but um, what is considered a completed application? So we talked about that. Um, for example, our process is that families must attend an informational meeting where they pick up an application. They have approximately 30 days to turn it in. Our verification process from initial verification to board approval is just under three months. They pull the credit report and criminal background upon receipt of applicant paperwork, but the application has to run through committee and a home interview must be completed to finish gathering information. At what point do we need to provide notice in this process and what type of notice must we give? Uh, an adverse action if you are declining the applicant. Uh, first, you And it says like, my question is in regard to ECOA. Yeah, this. Okay. So it's a 30 day from the time you have a completed application. And as I said earlier, a completed application is not the piece of paper with the boxes filled in. You have to have all those things in place for it to be a completed application. For equal credit opportunity, the, the, the writer is really, do you have enough information to make a, a credit decision? Um, and if you have enough information to make a credit decision, then it, it is defined as an application. And, it, and under equal credit opportunity, an application does not have to be written, it could be oral. And I'm going to take this opportunity to plug the ABA courses. For those of you who have not taken them, I really recommend that you do take them so that you can understand the differences in when a verbal request becomes an application. Um, so you need to to understand that, but for the the if you can remember a couple rules, as soon as you get your an application, you and you decision it, then you need to advise your applicant of your decision, and you have 30 days from the time you have all the information to make your decision. You have 30 days. Um, if you are accepting them in a program, then you would send them the welcome letter, and that and then. And the welcome letter, you still need to make sure that you let them know that if there is if there um, there is a decrease in their financial situation or something changes, that they still could you know possibly not get their house at this time. So you just need to make sure that you've got policies that identify the different processes that you have in terms of in terms of application and when your your notices are going to be uh, delivered. Okay, and Christy, just let me know if you think that asks, answers all of your question or if there's more about this, um, the 30-day interval. We just have, so. Okay. Leslie, we just have one more one more bit to add to that. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Christy, in your exact situation, we've been working with a bunch of affiliates as it relates to ECOA and how to actually define application in your process. And if we use your example, if you, in your policy, define application to include all of those things you listed, including that second credit check, that's what we recommend and here's why. Here's how it would work in your situation. Um, after your home visits, you would send your letter of acceptance into the program, but that's not our letter of acceptance of credit. So for ECOA purposes, that's not your notice of your decision. So you'd send your letter of acceptance into the program and then you'd be free to still collect all the information, do sweat equity, get the second credit check. And then when you're complete with all of that, you have 30 days to either send them a notice of acceptance of credit or notice of acceptance, notice of denial, the adverse action notice. But if at any time during that process you deny credit, then you have 30 days from that date of decision to send an adverse action notice. So the take home message is um, by defining application to be really, really long, the whole entire process, then you're giving yourself as much time as you need to start that 30 days running where you have to send them the notice. But again, no matter how you define application and no matter what stage of the application you're in, as soon as you deny credit, you have 30 days to send the adverse action notice. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Teresa's question. Hey, Eric, you've had your hand up. Um, if you could shoot me a chat and just let me know that you still want to ask a question. It may have been that it was related to something earlier. Um, but Eric, if you can chat back and let me know if you still want me to unmute you, that would be great. But um, Teresa's question was, even if we are exempt from qualified mortgage rules, do we need to focus on making sure they are qualified if we want to sell them? <laughs> Very good question. Um, the based on the based on the law, no. But you have to be guided by your partner. Even us at HFHI, with our securitization program that we have, we find that um, the lenders want to have everything. They want qualified mortgages, they want appraisals on everything, not just a evaluation tool, they were looking for actual appraisals. So you need to be guided by what your financial partner is seeking. Um, one of the things that I um, can suggest, if you've got good policies and procedures and you've got good underwriting um, um, policies and procedures in place and that's evidenced by a low delinquency rate, I think you could go into a conversation with your partner with that information saying, this is what we're doing, this is the policies and procedures and here's my delinquency rate to show that we do have a good track record, we are a high touch affiliate, we do, you know, the financial literacy and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, maybe they will accept it at that point. There are some lenders, some financial partners that will not, they want uh, qualified mortgages. So you just need to be guided by what you, what you plan to do if you're going to sell your loans, who are you selling them to, what are their needs for the loans that they're purchasing. All right, I am going to unmute Eric. He does still have questions. So, hi, Eric. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. I I, I deleted what I was going to ask you because I wrote it out to write that I still had to ask questions, but I think I remember my question. Huh. <laughs> so, I'm back. Uh, the question was referring to partial payments. And just to clarify, if the loan, let's say, is two months past due and they send us one month's payment. Is that a partial payment or is that a payment? It is considered a payment. It's a late payment and you would apply it to the oldest outstanding balance. Okay, but if they don't send us a full payment, then it is a partial payment. Right, so if their payment, your payment is $500 and they send you 350 it's a partial payment. And we do recommend that you hold it until you receive a full payment and then um, apply it. Okay, so the payment is $500 but there's a $10 late fee and they send us $500. Mm-hmm. You apply it to your, um, you apply it as your mortgage documents say and you send them another, another notice saying that they owe you $10. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, I just, I, now I'm clear. Can I ask another question? Sure. Certainly. And we didn't really talk about escrow uh, a bunch, but if the escrow is has an extra amount in there, but they're behind in their payments, can we apply that amount instead of giving them a credit or sending them a check? You have to, it depends on the amount. There are um, thresholds, I think, if it's under $50, um, you can do that. But I believe it's a, if it's over 50 you have to get their approval. Okay. Okay. Is that good, then, uh, Oh, go ahead. I, I one more. <laughs> okay, then the other one is for the, the the letters and stuff we were just talking about that have to go out. Does this apply to a brush with kindness if we don't, if those loans aren't attached to a mortgage? Let's say we just have a note on some of them. Which let the adverse action notice is that what you're referring to? The letters, I think the 45 day, 60 yes. day conversation we were having. I'm nope. not sure of the nope, requirements. Nope. I'm talking about the adverse. Oh, okay. Adverse. Great. 
Yes, adverse action notice, any consumer lending, whether it's a res mortgage or just a regular unsecured credit, which is traditionally what um, repairs are or a brush with kindness, you still are required to provide an adverse action notice. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Okay. All right, I brought this right. up. I know you wanted to um, mention some more about AML. There's obviously lots more questions and things, but um, we are at 12.14. The webinar is scheduled to end at 12.15. So um, for those who need to go, that's that's fine. Um, but I would like to end on time to also, so we are recording this, so the recording doesn't get too long, but people can listen. Um, so go ahead and I know you said, don't forget about AML. <laughs> okay. So there are um, just a couple things to note on AML. The AML law that Habitat falls under, the Branch uh, Bank Secrecy Act, uh, we were required to follow it in April of, sorry, August of 2012. What that requires of Habitat affiliates is two things, to have an AML policy as well as to, uh, a, sorry, an AML program as well as a, um, suspicious activity reporting program. For the AML policy what, or the AML program, what that entails is you must have a board approved uh, policy. You also need to identify an anti-money laundering compliance officer. There needs to be ongoing training at least um, annually and there also needs to be an independent audit of your um, money laundering program or anti-money laundering program. Now there are templates for the procedures, there's templates for the um, for the risk analysis and so on on my habitat under MPARU we have a site that or page that's actually dedicated to anti-money laundering. One of the things if you haven't already done anti-money laundering for your for your affiliate um, pop on the website and pull off the risk analysis and let that be the, the starting of your process. Analyze the AML risk in your, um, in your affiliate and then rank it. So you traditionally Habitat affiliates are considered low risk, but the government has identified certain regions and, and counties as high risk, either because of um, uh, drug trafficking or or um, financial crimes. So that's all covered in our risk assessment. Look at the risk assessment, make an, an assessment, and then start your policy because your risk assessment can determine how often you're going to review and update your policy. It will also identify who in your affiliate needs to be trained um, more rigorously than your annual training. Um, and it you it'll help you to walk through some of the, the, the type of suspicious activities that you may encounter um, within your affiliate. So if you haven't already done that um, and you need some guidance on it, please reach out to uh, either myself or Natasha Reed Rice or Sabrina, any of us, we can help you to walk through what you need to do to ensure that you're complying. This is a federal regulation. It is not an HFHI rec recommendation. You need to have a policy in place. You need to ensure that you're following the policy. All the key people in your affiliate need to be aware of the policy. If there is anything that they deem to be suspicious that they escalate it to your compliance officer who will determine if they need to file a suspicious activity report. Um, it, there's also the independent audit as I, recommend, as I mentioned earlier. The independent audit needs to be done on your program to, for, for it to be determined that your program is effective. Now, um, it cannot be done by your um, compliance officer. It has to be done by somebody independent and someone that also has a knowledge that can identify if there's any weaknesses or that your, your, your um, program is actually good. Um, I do recommend that you partner with a local bank um, and see if they can get one of their compliance officers to do that report or that audit for you. Again, let your risk analysis determine how often you um, 
do that uh, that independent audit. It doesn't necessarily have to be yearly. If you've got a low risk, truly a low risk affiliate, maybe that's done every two years. So do the risk analysis and let that set the tone for how you're going to um, execute your program. Okay. Thank you. And we have one question from a Minnesota affiliate, and I'm wondering if Susan might be able to respond to this one, but can Habitat Minnesota provide the independent audit for affiliates for the AML program? And I mentioned that Susan was on here. Susan, I can, I think you can unmute yourself and go ahead and speak if you'd like. If you unmute, if you click your own microphone, you could talk to us. There we go. Okay, am I, am I here? Yes, you are. Am I, yes, can you, can you hear me? Um, I would say at this point in time, we're not um, qualified to do that. What I feel like, what I'm feeling the, you know, overwhelming sense is to figure out a network of banks that could do that for our affiliates potentially. I need some help from the Minnesota affiliates on that, but I wouldn't, at least right now, I would not put us in the qualified to do that independent audit. Thanks, Susan. And Susan is our um, the director of our loan and grant program. Okay. <laughs> well, we are at um, a little bit over our time, so I think we have to say thank you. There aren't any more questions that came in. We did have somebody ask, how do we get to Empire University? I tried to show that a little bit, but um, do contact HFHI with questions, talk to your SSO. We can continue to provide some more resources to guide you through this, but um, we had such a great turnout, great questions. Um, yeah. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you so in much. The, in the uh, April, in the deck that was sent, there are links and several pages mm -hmm. to MPARU. Yep. And I just showed people too, if they haven't been on, sometimes we run into people who don't even know about My Habitat yet. So <laughs> that's also great to, to make sure that they know about that, particularly board members sometimes. Um, and we have a, another question that uh, just for those of us who need to develop all these policies and procedures, will HFHMN be willing to create or provide oversight for creating those? Uh, I'm going to unmute uh, Susan, but I would say yes. <laughs> but We do have a lot for the AML stuff. They're all yeah. out there. All the templates are out there and we are looking we're working with um, outside council to get the policies and templates out. Yeah, so I think going that, I went kind of more like we, I'm sure, can do some oversight again, not that there's that expertise per se, we're learning it along with you, but um, but we will, I'll pass that along to Susan. And the recording, we'll send out the link to the recording along with um, the follow-up email, and it will live on our YouTube channel. With that, um, again, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sabrina. Thanks for jumping in to, to <laughs> kind of last minute or with, to cover for um, Frankie, and we hope everything's okay with her. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And um, hopefully, oh, I have the, well, we don't have a lot of people here. I'll ask it in my follow-up survey, but let us know in your survey if this was helpful and if you feel better um, now than you did at the beginning. All right, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye.